Water, a fourth phase in its anti-gravitational property, presented on July 9th at the APEC conference online. Outline, a bit about me, personal background, metals and magnets, and how I came to try seawater and the phenomenon that I observed, and then other fluids and funny data and feeling like I'm going crazy. Uh, more experiments and data confirming of a new discovery, water phases, transition, molecular structures, and I'm not going crazy after all. And finally, some ideas on modification and control and how it might be applied to a uh, inertial propulsion engine, which I have called Vimy, Variable Inertia Mass Impulse Engine. So around 1991, being inspired by Back to the Future 2 and the hoverboards and, and um, being really interested in science and electronics, I developed a hypothesis that gravity could be countered with magnetism. So in the seventh grade, I tried uh, for my science fair project to make a crude electromagnet and hang it on a fishing scale with a switch and a battery to see what might happen. Needless to say, results were issues and my teacher was not at all impressed that I would even tackle such a topic. Uh, 20 years later, after graduating from a local mechanical engineering technology program, I was set on gravity research again, and some research online led me to Anti-Gravity, They All Told the Truth by Richard Crandall and Anti-Gravity Propulsion by Dr. Paula Violet. So in Richard's book, I learned magnetic and electric fields would partially align atomic nuclei in dense metals and dielectrics such as aluminum, lead, bismuth, copper, titanium dioxide, barium titanate. Crandall's ideas were revelatory for me to get me thinking about T.T. Brown, Anti-Gravity, Henry Wallace, Bob Lazar, wedges of 115, pod cutting off, and rotating superconductors, and how it all fits together. I was then experimenting with metals in magnetic fields to look for weak magnetically induced nuclear mass dipole phenomena to produce a Robert Forward type gravity propulsion. I experimented with rotating aluminum cones, such cones in magnetic fields as Crandall um, hypothesized. My methods were very crude, but I kept at it on and off. Uh, years later, I learned about Dr. Fred Alzafon through David, uh, his son's books and presentation, and now I had two independent researchers' theories that gravity and anti-gravity propulsion and control had something to do with polarizing atomic nuclei. I was then convinced it all had to do with rotation, nuclear polarization, and gravitomagnetism. This is why I talk so much about it here on this channel. So now working in tandem with DNO and DNP concepts I learned about, inspired by Fred Alzafon and uh, Crandall's theories, I have been attempting these types of DNP and EPR experiments on and off with some results. My path converged with Mark from Falcon Space because he was working on the Alzafon experiment as well. So in uh, autumn of 2021, I knew I had to get a sensitive electronic balance, a real scientific one. No more cheap kitchen scales. And I also learned that, or realized that magnets can affect the electronic balances, so I had to keep distance. So these uh, scientific balances are good for hanging samples beneath some distance. So that was very, uh, very useful. So I started doing that. So I said all that to say this, that about my accident, discovery, which I will be disclosing very shortly here. The reason why I have less hair today, I mean the reason this presentation came to be. So I started seeing weight changes in metal samples over time, uh, long periods of time, uh, late 2021, as they were attached to magnets and periodically weighed. Not many believed or cared, actually no one believed, and only to my knowledge Jeremiah Pop actually tried replicating my results. At this time I believe it's all related to quantum spin orientation, but this is not my focus today in this presentation. Maybe at a later time. So these findings led me to try seawater as I was at a beach one day. Seawater in a magnetic field, just like some metals, I thought might behave in a similar way. So I did, and the rest is what I found out, which was I didn't even need magnet to see weight loss. So we've heard the stories of accidental discoveries like radium, acetylene, gas, the gun diode, magnetism, frogs, legs, and electricity. So here is mine after seeing weight loss in some seawater water using magnets, sealed container. See there at the bottom, the uh, container there, the plastic container, had seawater in it and a big magnet, and I left it for hours. And then you can see how the balance went downwards right here after hours and so that was confirming of the things that i was seeing on the on the digital analytical balance down here is a in this photo you can see a sample of a little paper cup and inside would be some magnets and some sea water and, and i would suspend them below balance there so the magnets were far enough away i started plotting out all this data and i would see these these um curves start to form and um showing a pretty consistent loss in weight in each case so in this experiment here in on the right side the blue bar represent a cup with say seawater and magnets and the red represents a cup with no seawater but just magnets and you see here the uh, the very flat and consistent response without the seawater but then you can see the, uh, the loss in weight with the sample that had the seawater in it so I kept doing these experiments and I would see these characteristic drops in weight over time to the left which was nice because it looked like things were pretty predictable but then I started having problems when I decided to test a control which would be just a 
jar with just just the water in it and what I found out was quite interesting and troubling at the same time as you can see over here on the right the blue bars were the control jar and you can see that they were actually dropping weight here from 60 down to 50 and the red ones the red bars here represent the the sample which was one that I was magnetizing so I kept doing experiments and trying different arrangements trying to figure out what is going on here so I'd pour the fresh liquid into a container screw the cap on tight and compare with another container that had the same liquid in it for days and it was these little glass jars I was using where I noticed it I progressed into many experiments with glass sheets and um, uh, pickle jars and that kind of thing and other types of uh, sealable food containers on uh, mechanical balances too and so the question of evaporation keep coming up so I decided to try an experiment where I would just have um, jars with caps on and jars with caps off so this graph here shows jars with fresh water and salt water and two jars the two jars would have like one jar with fresh water one jar with salt water have the lids off and one jar with salt water one jar with fresh water with the lids on and this graph here shows the results of that over time you can see here the green line that has the greatest downward slope or the greatest weight loss was the one with the cap on and that was the salt water so that made it hard to believe that this was caused by evaporation and then I tried some other kinds of solutions you can see over here um, the different little jars I used uh, from like sodium chloride copper sulfate calcium chloride sugar water and a couple other chemicals potassium hexocyanoferrate ammonium iron 3 phosphate you can see here on the graph the, the results were the copper sulfate one was very steady uh, in contrast with the potassium hexocyanoferrate which had a very sharp drop initially and then it's tapered off and same with the sugar water had a very sharp drop and then tapered off so more experiments and more data uh, really started to confirm that there was really an effect going on here and it was not due to some artifact of my balance or some uh, other uh, experimental error so when I got into using um, capillary tubes uh, I because I started to realize that this has something to do with contact um, of surfaces over time. So on the left here, you can see uh, in this example, there's a drop of over 70 milligrams, which was with distilled water. And these uh, tubes were about 0.3 millimeters in diameter, and there'd be about 1500 of them. And uh, over here on the right would be same thing, uh, except I used bigger tubes, less tubes, but bigger ones like bigger diameter, 1.5 millimeter diameter. And here uh, shows a 50, 50 milligram loss. And this is how I would uh, do these experiments with the, I use pop bottles, screw the cap on tight, put dielectric grease in there. So just to be sure there'd be no evaporation losses. So on the left here would be uh, the distilled water. Um, this one would be, uh, this one here is potassium hexacyanoferrate and in the middle. And the one on the right is salt water and shaking after shaking it around there was no change in the weight on the balance so here is um, the data on the salt water one you can see the exponential drop there total drop of 100 milligrams and uh, before and after and then I got into trying uh, Pepto-Bismol because I learned that well I realized that I knew Pepto-Bismol had bismuth compounds in it uh, bismuth subsalicylate actually is the chemical and um, bismuth I know has a, uh, a large dense nuclei with unpaired spin so I wanted to test that out and um, you can see here in the, the results were very interesting um, initially a very big drop uh, over 100 milligrams as the Pepto interacted with the capillary tubes and um, you can see how the loss or how it sort of plateaued after you know like 18 to uh, from 18 hours to the uh, over the next 24 hours and over here on the right it's the same data it's just uh, extended further out but it really started to stabilize um, after 18 hours so these are the pictures of that experiment um, which I shared on YouTube the video on this channel um, as you can see here so uh, so what I did was I put the Pepto-Bismol in the test tube and the capillary tubes and then I put the cap on with the grease and this is a picture of uh, grease I use and the capillary tubes and um, so what I did was I weighed it in this form here with Pepto in the test and then I dumped the Pepto out onto the capillary tubes and shook it around a little bit and then put it back on the balance and weighed it again and there was an immediate drop in weight and that's what shows on the graph there that 100 milligram loss and later on I decided decided to do more testing with that, the Pepto Bismol and the glasses so in this plastic uh, food container here which is well sealed because of the uh, plastic um, 
gasket. So I uh, put the Pepto in, some paper cups, and the glass tubes in there, weighed it, and then I would dump the Pepto out of the cup so that it made contact with the glass tubes. And then I'd weigh it again. And sure enough, I saw, I saw a loss in weight that was quite pronounced uh, in the beginning, uh, over about two two hours, and then it plateaued, it wouldn't change anymore. Like it came back like a day later, and it was still the same. So I tried another kind of experiment um, where, because I realized it was this had surface area, so I certain surfaces that were hydrophilic. So I thought this uh, wire here, this stranded wire, would be great, because it has so many so many strands, um, power car audio cable here. So I uh, spread it out in the water, a puzzling negative result, which ended up revealing to me another secret. So so what I found was that this didn't do anything, didn't lose any weight, and I was trying to think why that would be, so uh, doing a bit of research I found this stuff about these, these cables, and they're actually coated in tin, so they're copper wires, and the tin coating keeps the oxidation off the copper, and that helps uh, the conductivity properties and stuff of these cables. So, so uh, I realized that oxidation is an, must be an important factor on the surface, or the ability of the surface to uh, like or attract oxygen oxygen atoms. And this is why I found that aluminum and some other materials work well. Uh, in this case, it uh, didn't work. So I tried aluminum heat sinks because they have lots of surface area. And um, in this case here, I would put the heat sink on top of the water container, put it on the balance, balance it out. Then I would put the heat sink inside the water, put the lid on, and then almost immediately there would be this drop on the balance here. And it's small, but it actually does represent about a 100 to 200 uh, dip in the weight, which is consistent with what I've been seeing on the digital balance. Um, and like in the other cases, there would be some rapid initial loss, a plateau. And whoops. so I had another six fig, six significant figure digital balance that I wanted to try this with, uh, just in comparison with the triple beam mechanical one. So I, I did the same thing here, weighing with the heat sinks on top and then weighing after I immersed the heat sinks in the water. And I found that the weight was, weight was always lost, usually in the range of a couple hundred milligrams. And it happens rapidly at first and then plateaus and uh, doesn't change at all. So Jeremiah Pop volunteered to test these results himself, thankfully. And he did some similar experiments to mine where he got some, uh, some small capillary tubes, a little bit of water, and five cc's of uh, deionized water. And in this case here, he, well, he actually ran these experiments a long, long time, uh, but due to technical problems with the video um, processing, he wasn't able to provide much more than what you see here. But I think this is enough to, to show that he is actually seeing the results as well, uh, as you can see in this graph here. And if you look at the readings on the balances over time, from one minute to two hours, three hours, 14 hours, 22 hours, you can see the last three digits on the weight dropping there for a total of 22 milligrams in this case. He said he put capped on tape on there to prevent or slow down evaporation. He did some other experiments too here. The one on the left is the pop bottle one, like mine, uh, with capillary tubes inside, and reported about a 70 milligram loss in weight over 34 hours. And in there he put 10% Pepto and 90% bottled water. And um, oh, I should mention he, he was showing the temperature to their um, that little um, read out there on the little black box there, 82 degrees in, in those pictures. And here on the right is another thing he did with these little um, food packets, uh, little plastic things. You actually melt the plastic and it seals it. So he did Pepto-Bismol here and uh, water here and noted that these things would these things would lose weight too uh, over time. So the thing about water is everyone is a water expert because everyone thinks they know everything about water. So we all know basics about water. Even kids know this stuff. We play in it, drink it, uh, bathe in it. We clean things with it. It boils at 100 degrees, freezes at zero, falls from the sky, composes clouds, lakes, and oceans. Uh, less people know it expands when freezing, forms hydrogen bonds within itself, giving it a skin. It's composed of H2O, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, deuterium, tritium. It's called the universal solvent. It absorbs and dumps large amounts of energy during physical phase changes before there's temperature changes. Uh, molecules rotate, bend, vibrate, twist, and it's easily decomposed by passing electrical current through it into hydrogen and oxygen. It's also combustible. It will explode in that form. And fewer know that water actually has many ice phases. In fact, up to 19. 
So here you see on the left is the temperature in Kelvin, and on the bottom here is pressure in gigapascals. And so these Roman numerals here represent uh, different phases of ice. So that means like uh, different molecular structure, different crystal structure, and different properties. The ice changes through these uh, phases. There's one called super ionic ice, which is really interesting as far as I could tell. And some scientists, they call it like a new phase of matter. It's a new phase of matter, as this Olivia Bove notes. And um, some other groups uh, say the super pressurized ice melted at around 4,700 degrees Celsius. And about as expected for super ionic ice, and that it did conduct electricity thanks to the movement of charged protons. So it's like a, a metal, metals conduct electricity through free electrons. With super ionic ice, they conduct elect uh, electricity can be conducted by protons. So there'll be more on ice in the next few slides because this effect may be related to all phase changes of matter. But am I dealing with a different phase of water? Well, according to Dr. Gerald Pollock and team, water has a fourth phase. So yeah, this fourth phase is probably what I'm dealing with. So they found out water is, this phase is, is a type of water that's jelly-like, uh, physically in between solid and liquid. It excludes all particles and purities and has been named the exclusion zone, or easy water, for this reason. When easy water forms, an electric field spans across it, which can be used as a mini battery. Easy water has a distinct molecular formation, resembling a grid of hexagons, like honeycombs, with oxygen atoms at the junctions, and the new molecule, he notes, would be H3O2. Easy water forms on hydrophilic surfaces such as glass. The easy water can be enhanced by light, uh, more specifically thermal energy from some of my tests. And these are a couple of um, videos that were... So here's some um, diagrams I drew out from, from the slides in the other video, which I didn't play because of its length. So here you see uh, a typical hydrophilic surface and then so these easy layers of water form here over time or almost immediately I think in most cases. And uh, just to note their basic structure here according to Dr. Pollock, it's like a, a hexagonal honeycomb structure and these layers would pack very tightly and overlap these layers of H3O2. And so here, uh, like he said in the little video there, that uh, so there would be a polarization that would occur over across these layers and into the bulk water. It would form in, in essence, it would form something like a, like a capacitor. So here, um, the surface again, and the easy water forms away from the walls, pushing all the impurities away, and it is enhanced by uh, a light source um, irradiating on it, like uh, specifically uh, infrared sources. Um, it seems to also resemble something uh, like glass-like properties. So when glasses form, here we have a crystal. Uh, you see the patterns are highly uh, organized um, in a rigid lattice, and crystals tend to be very brittle as well. Uh, liquid, the, the uh, molecules arrange themselves in a very random type of way, and they're disordered and they're, they're in motion. But in a glass, uh, a glass has disordered molecules like a liquid, yet is solid and rigid like a crystal. Glass is still considered pretty mysterious, um, and the deepest and most interesting unsolved problem in solid state theory is probably the theory of the nature of glass and the glass transition, P.W. Anderson. The long process of forming glass as molecules slowly settle into tightly packed, dense formations, I think may have something to do with Pollock's exclusion zone water, but also this mass loss property which they uh, don't seem to make any acknowledgement of. This suggests perhaps that many other phase transitions involve changes in inertial mass, or could. Which brings me to the idea of small water droplets. I, when I look at clouds, I think, could these cloud particles or these droplets of water actually be levitating? I mean, why don't they just fall to the ground? Um, so I found out they are actually pretty small on average. They're micrometers in diameter compared to the average raindrop which is about two millimeters which would be about 200 times larger so studies have been done on water droplets uh, over here on the right you can see this chart where you know the the fall distance versus lateral movement 
So the larger droplets fall much quicker, and the smaller ones hardly fall before they evaporate again. So what I propose is that if water droplets are small enough, uh, they're composed primarily of this fourth phase of water, the highly ordered dense H3O2 phase, which has a reduced mass and therefore reduced coupling to Earth's gravity. So basically this droplet will never be pulled to the ground by gravity. And so this is the reason why I think maybe clouds might float as well as fog. But as warm water molecules coalesce on these droplets and make them larger and more massive, then they of course get heavier and then fall to the ground. So in this um, little diagram here, so the radius there is about 10 micrometers. Uh, you can see how it forms on an aerosol particle, typically um, one micrometer to 10 micrometers. But more experiments, uh, more controlled study needs to be done in this. So it also got me thinking about how uh, water might climb up very high heights like, uh, for example, up tree trunks uh, over, say, 100 feet in height, which is quite remarkable how it's able to do that. But has anyone suspected that maybe water loses some of its weight as it does this? As it climbs, um, water feels heavy to us. You know, when we pick up a bucket of water and, or pick up water, it can be, uh, feel quite heavy. And yet it's able to climb these very high heights, seemingly miraculously. So what I know, and today you now know, stuck with me through this presentation. So we're all water experts now, aren't we, right? So as water in distilled or solution forms is poured into a hydrophilic container such as glass, even some plastics and interacts with other surfaces, um, the weight drops exponentially. As this easy water layer or skin forms over time, this fourth phase is losing either A, coupling to earth gravity but not inertial mass, B, inertial mass and therefore gravitational force, which is the equivalence principle. So if A makes gravity reduction or anti-gravity possible, probably makes it useless for propulsion. B, if it's not anti-gravity but inertia control, therefore it can be useful for propulsion. And I'll explain a bit more about that later on. Propose an example. Is this a natural kind of coherent matter? a natural nuclear orientation, polarization of nuclear gravitomagnetism. Does the Earth's ether flow pass more freely through this coherent state? Is there less vacuum fluctuations in easy water? And perhaps many other substances in a glassy state? All this remains to be understood. Furthermore, and by extension, during the crystallization of water, during freezing, it likely is losing weight. Although this experiment is a little more difficult to carry out because of condensation problems, However, I did try it, and yes, there was a weight difference going from ice to liquid. So this is uh, something I tried a while back. Uh, it was a simple experiment where I would just put a ice cube in that uh, pink plastic dish in a Ziploc bag and weigh it and then uh, let it sit overnight and melt and then come back the next day and weigh it again. And so what I found in this example was a 25 milligram loss uh, as it melted to liquid and came to room temperature. So this seemed a little bit counterintuitive to me. So I, I did check the bag for condensation gains or anything like that. I thermally isolated the sample from the balance plate with a paper cup, calibrated before measuring. And so, yeah, that's what I came up with that, with that one. I tried the similar experiment a few weeks later. I just wanted to double check. So what I found was overall a, as in the last case, a 40 milligram, uh, well, in this case it was more, actual weight loss, but it was a weight loss when it melted from ice cube state to uh, water liquid state overnight. And you can see there the progression of uh, the readings on the on the balance. And that little one there in the middle with the green plastic object, that was just, uh, I used a, a control weight um, just to make sure the balance was reading accurately before I took a sample weight. So on to um, methods of controlling this phenomenon. I did a few different experiments. Um, this one here that you see was just something I, I did kind of quickly. I grabbed this pickle jar out of my fridge uh, that was already conveniently chilled to, as you can see, about 10 degrees Celsius. And uh, it was in a, a sealed jar, uh, about a third full, and pickle juice contains salt and vinegar. And so I wanted to see how temperature would uh, uh, affect the the weight here. So as you can see um, on the left, from left to right is the sequential progression. 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, last two digits are reading 80.84 grams. 21 degrees Celsius. 
uh, 0.62 grams, 34 degrees Celsius, 0.49. And I just put it on the stove for a little while to warm it up. So the overall change was 0.34 grams or 340 milligram. I tried it to something similar again with just tap water, uh, same jar actually. So um, A, B, C, D was in chronological order. So I started with uh, warming the water on a stove to 45 degrees on the surface, see what it weighed there. And then I let it cool down to room temperature, 19 degrees Celsius. And then I put it in the freezer for a while and the surface cooled down to six degrees Celsius. And then I warmed it up again on the stove to 38 degrees Celsius. And I tried to I shake it around and make sure the uh, heat gets spread evenly through the water. Um, in picture C there, uh, you can see there's some condensation on the jar, which I couldn't really keep off. I kept wiping it with a towel before I would weigh it. Uh, I think it's negli negligible, but um, in the grand scheme of things, it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's negligible. So from B to C, gained 130 milligrams after cooling. C to D, it lost 140 milligrams after warming. So this is pretty consistent with um, the previous slide. Uh, the relationship with the temperature. Uh, the reason why A and B was seems a bit uh, contradict the earlier results was as of what I think is happening here. So on this chart you see weight is represented here and time and temperature is represented here on the x-axis. So what I found out is that when I freshly pour a liquid into a glass jar for example the weight seems to drop a little bit. You see, that's what this curve represents. And then also when it's warmer, it tends to weigh less. So as it cools down, it tends to gain a little bit of weight, but it's also losing weight because of this phenomenon as it's freshly poured into the container. So the resultant is this little bit of almost undetectable change, the resultant. So I did this um, before I did what I just showed you. I did this experiment and put it on my channel here. Uh, which is basically, uh, what's the, I used a 100 watt light bulb, put it in this jar, sealed it, um, the wires coming through the top here, and it was all sealed up with hot glue. And here is just tap water. And so what I did would do is turn it on, and then turn it off and let it cool. And I just do that a few times and, and cycle through and, and see how the, uh, the weight will change here. So uh, you can see here, uh, starting at room temperature, 18 degrees Celsius, uh, this is what it was weighing. And then after leaving the light bulb on for a while, uh, I found that uh, the weight went down uh, by is that six, seven, 70 milligrams. And then letting it cool down again, the weight returned somewhat, uh, which, is, uh, which is interesting and then cool down another six degrees or so. And then the weight went up a little bit more, say another 30 milligrams. That's the video there. This I saw several years ago uh, from one of James Woodward's patents, um, which I thought was very, uh, very intriguing. Um, it just shows a, this concept here of a propulsion scenario where you have a transducer in the middle. You have mass on each end. And if you can alternate the mass, the inertial mass here, represented by these two balls, uh, and, and cycle that with the right timing, you can cause a net motion in, in this direction uh, towards the right of the screen. So inertial mass is, uh, is cycled between the two spheres and an actuator pushes them apart. Woodward has confirmed that this principle works uh, but the force is very small and barely detectable with advanced torsion balances. Um, he worked with devices using piezoelectric discs um, that worked as the actuator in the, um, or the transducer and also a inertial mass. And so those, uh, those piezo discs would push against a, uh, a reaction mass like a brass puck or something like that. And some of his earlier concepts, uh, some of the earlier work he describes combinations of inductors and capacitors uh, to function as positive and negative masses depending on how they're energized. So just a few basics about propulsion um, and the idea of um, you know, like with a really small amount of thrust, if if 
acceleration can be really large, say 10G or 100G or 1000G, uh, a small change in mass of a few grams could result in significant force. Or a longer actuation stroke with a smaller force gives a significant impulse too, as you can see here. Uh, force times time, newtons, newton seconds. So the real beauty is practically an unlimited, with practically an unlimited number of cycles, only limited by an energy source and mechanical wear and tear on such a, an engine or system. Because no propellant is lost, so impulses can cycle for hours, days, weeks, or months. So even a small acceleration applied over a few hours or days creates enormous displacement, which increases exponentially with time. So I came up with this concept, uh, which I just called variable inertial mass impulse engine. Uh, so the mass of water is cycled between high and low, denoted by the big M and small m. So this would be a little bit more massive. This would be a little bit less massive. Experiments have shown that higher thermal energy reduces the weight and vice versa. Therefore, should reduce or increase inertial mass. And it appears that this can be cycled. The cycle is reminiscent of the thermodynamic cycles of a Stirling engine or heat pump. There is no need for propellant because the concentration or dissipation of inertial mass achieves the same purpose without the loss of matter. And that's a distinction that I see uh, between matter and mass is that the amount of matter you have can't change, that is the number of particles. However, their mass can change a little bit, practically speaking. So this diagram here is just a uh, schematic diagram of, so the light blue here represents two equal water tanks uh, containing special kinds of surfaces. Um, and in between them is an actuator, a lot like Woodward's diagram. And then as the two tanks are, uh, the, the surfaces are, are heated and cooled respectively, um, their inertial mass changes and then the actuator pushes them apart. And then that cycle is reversed here in state two. And then the actuator pulls them together. And then you get a net displacement uh, of the whole thing towards the uh, bottom of the screen here. So in practice here, state zero may be omitted as the engine runs. Temperature states would be achieved before the actuator is pulsed. Operation would be based on a simple push-pull cycle. And for deep space missions here, um, conventionally speaking, um, nuclear energy looks like a good option for heating water and also powering the entire spacecraft. I have a private chat for a development of this concept. And if you are interested in joining this group to contribute with uh, engineering work or insight, uh, it will be for serious, uh, it's a serious effort. So if you're interested in that, you can email me at centronamics at gmail.com. Thanks for your attention and May this serve to inspire and uh, bring us to the next level in uh, space propulsion and a better future. Thanks for your support.